sponsored by Just Leadership USA and the Milwaukee Office of the MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge Project. I will be your host for this evening's event and glad to have you join us. Just Leadership is a national criminal justice reform organization committed to cutting the national prison population in half by 2030. We believe that those closer to the problem are closer to the solutions. We seek to reach our goal by educating, elevating, and empowering the people and communities most, packed by, most impacted by systemic racism to drive, amplify, and sustain the kinds of policy reforms that builds thriving, sustainable, and healthy communities. The MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge Project was launched in 2015 and is currently a five-year, $217 million project dedicated to finding better, fairer, and more effective alternatives to excessive jail incarceration. The project is currently operating in 51 cities across the nation. These 51 jurisdictions receive financial excuse me, financial and technical support in their efforts to rethink justice systems and to implement data-driven strategies to safely reduce jail populations. Milwaukee is one of those jurisdictions. Like other jurisdictions, the Milwaukee Safety and Justice Challenge Program is committed to identifying the drivers of over-incarceration in the Milwaukee area. Uh, part of this process is to engage a diverse set of community stakeholders to determine ways to address local drivers of over-incarceration, to address racial disparities in incarceration, and to improve the system as a whole. That is the purpose of this town hall meeting today. We seek to get your input, your feedback, and increase your engagement with the Milwaukee Safety and Justice Challenge Program to help reach the goal of cutting the jail population and addressing criminal justice reform issues in Milwaukee and across the country. Uh, our local partners are for this event are Maddie po Mandy Potapakinko, Director of Milwaukee Community Justice Council, Khalif Muab Il of Breaking Barriers and All of Us and None, Aaron Perkins, who is Safety and Justice Challenge Project Manager. We have Sean, we have Sean Wanzo of Our Future, Tom Reed. We have Tom Reed of the Wisconsin Public Defender's Office and Kent Laverne of the Milwaukee County District Attorney's Office. I'd like to welcome you all to today's meeting and give our guests a round of applause, please. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to do a short overview of the Milwaukee SJC project. Mayor Aaron? Sure, let me just pull up the PowerPoint presentation. All right, um, I hope everyone can see this. It should say Milwaukee County SJC Initiative. Yep, we can see it. Great. Um, so good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Perkins and I am the Safety and Justice Challenge Project Manager for Milwaukee County. I work alongside Mandy uh, Potopenko, who is our director at the CJC. And thank you all for being here with us this evening and taking the time to learn more about the Safety and Justice Challenge and give us your input about where um, this initiative can go. Um, in the future. So just wanted to give you some background about what the Safety and Justice Challenge has looked like in Milwaukee. Um, so the MacArthur Foundation is a private foundation. It's the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. They're based in Chicago. And they, this is one of the many projects that they have in their portfolio. So criminal justice is one of their, what they call a big bet. Uh, they also do work around like climate solutions, um, nuclear threats to uh, nuclear threats in the world, um, addressing corruption in Nigeria. Um, so a number of different areas where they're making significant investments um, in the hopes that by putting a lot of resources into specific areas that they can make significant reductions and impact um, significant issues in the world. And so one of those areas is mass incarceration. Um, so these are some figures that I pulled from the MacArthur Foundation website, uh, just to give you a sense of why MacArthur Foundation has chosen jails in particular um, as their focus area for mass incarceration. So the reason why MacArthur Foundation is looking at jails is because jails have more admissions than prisons do, and that many of the people that are brought into jails um, are there for nonviolent offenses. Uh, most of the people that are in jail, these are actually national figures, but it's true also for Milwaukee that the majority of the people that are in our jail are there pre-trial. So they're waiting for some kind of decision to be made 
or for some kind of resolution to be made in their case. Uh, many of the individuals that we have in jails and in prisons um, are there and have significant vulnerabilities, including behavioral health challenges, uh, which can factor into their coming into the jail. Uh, jails are also um, a, an area where we have significant racial disparities. Milwaukee is one of those sites. Uh, many of our sites across the country, but Milwaukee included, um, have seen significant racial disparities in our jails. And also we have sizable amounts of our public dollars going into the criminal justice in our jails. And so for that reason, for those reasons, uh, the MacArthur Foundation has decided to funnel uh, millions of dollars into sites across the country, including Milwaukee County, in the hopes that they can introduce different reforms that will reduce the use of jails. So ultimately, uh, the MacArthur Foundation will say that the primary purpose of a jail is to detain those who are awaiting trial who are a danger to public safety or a flight risk, and that if we're jailing people who don't fall into either one of those categories, um, it's usually communities of color, families, uh, communities as a whole that are bearing the brunt of that, um, and that we have people that lose income, you have parents who are separated from their kids, people who have untreated mental health and substance use challenges, um, people have a greater risk of reoffending, and we're also wasting public dollars. So with all of those things considered, it makes sense for us to put our time and attention and resources into addressing um, the impact of jails on mass incarceration. So the safety and justice challenge has three goals, or we at least add the third goal um, here in Milwaukee County. So you can see all the different sites across the country. Milwaukee County is one of them. Dane County is the other site that's here in Wisconsin that's funded by MacArthur Foundation. And the three goals are, um, one is to reduce the misuse and the overuse of jails um, or the over-reliance of jails, as we put it. Uh, we're also aiming to reduce or address racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal justice system through the safety and justice challenge. And then the third goal that we include is to engage the broader community and systems change, which is something that the MacArthur Foundation has included from the very beginnings of the initiative. Um, even though they don't articulate it as a third goal of the safety and justice challenge, it's always been a priority for the foundation, so we've included it as the third goal. So as Ronald mentioned, there's been three phases of the safety and justice challenge. So the first phase, which, is in, in, which was in 2015, um, sites across the country were engaged um, to do some planning and just development of different site strategies. So all safety and justice challenge sites have different strategies based off of what the key drivers of incarceration are in that jurisdiction. In phase two, the MacArthur Foundation provided funding and technical assistance to help implement the strategies that were identified in the first phase of the SJC. And then in phase three, they continued to provide funding and technical assistance to implement strategies, but they also included additional support for community engagement for sites. And then lastly, um, MacArthur Foundation will be continuing to do the safety and justice challenge, um, but they will be focused more on sustainability in the next phase. So the phase three will end at the end of 2020, and then the sustainability phase would pick up in 2021. Um, and we are planning or we are applying for additional funding to continue this work. So our current portfolio of strategies, um, you'll see on the bottom, the previous strategies that we had for the safety and justice challenge under phase two, and then the ones in the blue box on the top are the strategies that we have under phase three. Um, so we have case processing, which is focused on making sure that cases are moving from start to finish as efficiently as possible and that we don't have systems gaps um, that are leading to people staying in custody longer than they really need to be there. Uh, we have mental health diversion, which is focused on identifying people in the jail who have mental health challenges and linking them to resources back in the community. Um, community engagement, of course, um, so making sure that we're involving our community in the development of strategies and figuring out priorities for both the CJC and the Safety and Justice Challenge. Uh, Reentry work, so supporting people who are coming back into the community after a period of incarceration and trying to prevent them from cycling through the system. And then data capacity, so making sure that the decisions that we're making are being informed by um, the most up-to-date and accurate data that we have available. Um, so you'll see they're a little bit different. Some of them have been carried over um, exactly as they're written, like expanded data, um, but some of them have just been embedded. So um, the book and refer policy, uh, which was implemented to reduce the number of people who are in custody um, for misdemeanor offenses or nonviolent misdemeanor offenses, 
that is now an embedded policy in the Milwaukee Police Department. So it wasn't continued as a phase three policy because the work, the policy has been created and it's embedded in the Milwaukee Police Department's. Um, both the CART and post-booking stabilization strategies were mental health strategies. Um, so they've continued under the mental health diversion work. Uh, the trauma trainings that we did under phase two, those have continued under community engagement in phase three. And then the family violence strategy um, is now embedded into case processing. So even though you don't see them there, the work is continued. They're just worded a little differently. So I went back and forth about whether or not to put all of this data in the presentation. Um, and the one thing that I do want to mention here is before I throw a bunch of data at you is to recognize that these data represent people. And so I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that even though we're talking about numbers and trends that we're talking about real people that are in a real jail in Milwaukee. And so um, I show you this information just so that you know what the trends overall have looked like, but I don't wanna lose sight of the fact that um, these are not just numbers that we're talking about. These are people and that they're really at the center of what we're doing. So the jail, when we're talking about the jail in Milwaukee, we're talking about the criminal justice facility or the CJF, as well as the House of Correction, which is down in Franklin or HOC. The baseline average daily jail population that we use to figure out where our jail population is up, down, or sideways is 2,272. And that was based off of monthly jail data that was calculated from one of our strategic partners that we have through the Safety and Justice Challenge. The target average daily population that we were aiming for in phase three was 1,833. Um, I do also have the phase two target up there. Um, so we are aiming to reduce our jail population from that 2,272 down to that 1,833 figure. And then if you look at the chart here on the bottom, I don't know if you can see my arrow. Um, but as of December of 2019, just so you know what the trends looked like prior to COVID, um, we had already surpassed our targets for our ADP and got down to 1,809. Um, of course, with coronavirus, there's been a huge focus on trying to get as many people um, out of custody to prevent transmission as possible. Um, so you can see that as of September of 2020, um, our jail population had declined by about 35% from baseline. Um, I also have our booking figures on here as well. Um, you can see when we started in the safety and justice challenge, we had almost 3000 bookings into our jail in May of 2016. And then by September of 2020, you have about 1300. Um, so it was a reduction of about 55%. So COVID has had a really significant, we already had some reductions, but COVID in particular has really driven the jail population to be much smaller. I also included the bookings year to date, both for 2020 and for last year. Um, historically, our jail bookings were much higher. We've had them as high as 50,000 jail bookings in 2006. Um, in 2009, um, they had dropped from where they were uh, when the Milwaukee Community Justice Council was founded. Uh, so we were down to about 31,000 jail bookings in 2019, but with COVID, they've dropped even further to about 14,000 so far this year. Um, one thing I should note here is that even though we've had significant reductions in the jail population overall, we've still continued to struggle with racial and ethnic disparities, um, which has been true for all sites or many sites in the safety and justice challenge. Um, our jail last year, about two thirds of our jail bookings were people of color. Um, looking at our data between January and August of this year, about 68% or 69% of our jail bookings were people who are black. Um, by comparison, about 30% of our jail population are individuals who are white. Um, and just looking at Snapchat or looking at snapshots of uh, individuals who are in our jail on the last day of the month, um, it looks like the black population is growing as a proportion of our jail population. So we have seen with COVID an increase in disparities and it's an area that we've continued to, to struggle with and something that going forward, we're planning to have additional focus on. So um, just so you know, some of the things that we've been working on as part of the safety and justice challenge and some of um, the different policies and things that we've put into place here in Milwaukee County using the resources and technical assistance from MacArthur Foundation. Uh, we funded uh, one of the first, the first CART team that had countywide jurisdiction. Uh, CART stands for Crisis Assessment Response Team. Um, so this is a team that pairs a BHD clinician with law enforcement 
um, to go out and try to respond to behavioral health um, incidents out in the community and try to keep people in the community and not bring them into the criminal justice system. Um, so previously, those teams were more focused on specific geographic areas, but this was the first one that could go throughout Milwaukee County. And that team will actually um, now be paired with the sheriff's office um, going forward. Uh, we created a program to be able to divert people who have behavioral health challenges uh, with mental health, people who have beha uh, behavioral health challenges back uh, into community-based resources. Uh, we created a quote unquote speedy dispo court or an expedited disposition, disposition calendar to try to um, filter some additional cases out of the system if they're ready for resolution. Um, during COVID, we also launched a jail population review team which routinely looks at lists of individuals who are in the jail to try to determine who um, may be safely monitored out in the community and doesn't need to be in custody. We've increased capacity to do additional diversions and deferred prosecution agreements. Uh, we've trained over 500 or 550 criminal justice stakeholders on trauma in the criminal justice system using a SAMHSA curriculum. Uh, book and refer, the first bullet point refers to book and refer, so that was the policy to, re to reduce jail bookings that were tied to nonviolent misdemeanor offenses. We started organizing with the Department of Workforce Development some home to stay reentry resource fairs to connect people who are coming out of the system with community based resources. Uh, we're also in the process of hiring um, some peer supports for the transitions clinic with Aurora and Progressive Healthcare. Uh, so that as people are coming back out of the system, they have a peer support network as well as uh, resources to address different medical concerns that they have. And then finally, uh, we should be releasing community subgrants um, in the coming weeks. Um, so we're taking a portion of the community subgrant dollars, about $180,000, and putting those into community-based resources um, and community-based programs to be able to support work that aligns with the safety and justice challenge in Milwaukee. Um, so that is, um, in a nutshell, the background of the safety and justice challenge in Milwaukee. And it, by all means, um, I will put a link in the chat box to our website for the safety and justice challenge and the CJC so that people can visit our website and learn more about our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. That was a beautiful presentation. Uh, I would like to encourage our audience to, as you listen to the conversation and you hear the activities going on with the Safety and Justice Challenge Program, and you hear the panelists discuss the work that's being done, I want you to think about ways that you as a community person can become involved and be engaged with some of the work that they're doing. Because what we, would, what we seek to do, what the whole purpose of this event is to increase the engagement between the community and the Safety and Justice Challenge. As you heard Aaron just say, they, they have a $180,000, they're gonna re-grant, sub-grant to community organizations. So you may wanna think about ways that your organization could apply for that money that they're going to be given. You can look for ways to get involved in some of the other activities that they have going. And to actually uh, be involved in the process of setting up some of these programs. Because what we seek to have is those closer to the problem to be closest to the solutions. And that means to have you at the table helping to determine uh, how policies get created and implemented. So with that being said, we have a couple of poll questions we would like to uh, launch and have you guys respond to before we get into the panel discussion. Erica, would you put the question, present the poll questions, please? We'll give everybody about a minute or so to respond and then we'll see what the responses are. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, so let's let's just talk about the results briefly. 
Um, what was the number one barrier to participation and engagement in this work of criminal justice reform in your community? 57% of you said resources and 36% said lack of awareness. And so that, that's, thanks for, thanks for your responses. We'll try to address those issues. And the second question was, what are your top reform priorities? And the, the top priority in your community is 57% of you said crime is parole, probation, revocation. And it's kind of a toss up between mental health, diversion, restorative justice, and restorative justice at 43%. So thank you for sharing your responses and we'll see what we can do about having some feedback for you in those areas. But this time, I'd like to turn to our panelists. We have a great set of panelists for you this evening to have a conversation. And I would like each of our panelists to take two or three minutes just to briefly introduce yourself. You know, tell you, state your name, your city, your state, title, the organization you work with, and what brought you to this work, what brings you to this work and this conversation we have this evening. Uh, Aaron, since you just did the, uh, did the PowerPoint, why don't you introduce yourself first, please? I thought I was gonna get a break because I did the PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Erin Perkins, like I said. Um, I was born and raised here in Milwaukee, uh, and I am the project manager for the Safety and Justice Challenge, so I'm over at the Milwaukee Community Justice Council. Uh, so what brings me to this work? I'm a native of Milwaukee. I was born and raised on the north side. Um, so for me, this work is really about giving back and working towards improving my hometown. Um, I come to the table as someone who had a parent who was incarcerated and had many of my family members who interfaced with the system in some way. And so having seen the impact that the system can have on families and on communities and on individuals, it's just personally important to me as well to do this work. And then finally, it's just, I mean, you can't look at the system and feel like it's perfect. Uh, we wouldn't be here if we felt like it was. Um, so it's because I believe that we can build a system that strikes a better balance between justice and public safety and better uses its resources and just creates a more supportive environment, both for people on the front end so that they don't ever come into the system, but also on the back end um, to help people as they're transitioning back into the community. Thank you. Khalif, would you be next, please? Khalif, are you there? I see your name. Well, Sean, while we wait on Khalif, why don't you go next, Sean? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Okay. I had a whole bunch of muting going on here. Uh, my name is Minister Khalif Moabel. I'm the Executive Director of Breaking Barriers Mentoring, Inc. and founder. And I'm um, the president of All of Us and None. What brings me to this work, I'm not a native of Milwaukee per se, but I was the youngest, I was the youngest person sent to the adult prison from Milwaukee straight to the adult prison without going through Ethan Allen or anything like that at the age of 15 years old. I was sentenced to 15 years to an adult prison and I went to the worst prison here in the state of Wisconsin where I did 10 years in solitary confinement. And during that time, I was able to experience and witness all of the atrocities that come along with being incarcerated as well as the epidemic of mass incarceration. <clears throat> Given that, I was able to work my way to freedom through various stages of litigation and um, educating myself and being self-taught as well as going to college and, you know, things like that in prison. But mostly I was self-educated and that prompted me to when I came home to do this work and to be engaged in this work so that I can see some kind of a reform so that the generations coming behind me wouldn't experience the things that I experienced going in at such an early age. So essentially um, prison, the state of Wisconsin prison system essentially raised me. And I'm a product of um, a plethora of various different mentors that I met in the system that I wore palms with that were good brothers, that were well-intentioned, highly intelligent, freedom fighters, and things of that nature that gave me the tools that I need to be who I am today. So I lift them up in this space at this moment. Thank you, Minister. We appreciate that. Tom, would you go next, please? Um, yes. Uh, so I'm Tom Reed. 
I run the public defender's office here in Milwaukee and we appoint lawyers, staff and private bar to you know all the adult criminal cases that, that come through. Um, it's really important obviously that we do that work effectively because people have a great deal at stake when they go to court and when they're charged with offenses. But I guess I would say we try to teach our lawyers that we represent people and not cases. And when you are concerned about people and not just their cases, then you realize that if we are going to make progress towards having a better outcome for our community, we have to do that in collaboration with other people. And the MacArthur Foundation is just a perfect example of where uh, with the help of a large foundation, we've been able to bring people together across systems to do a lot of work, which I think before the uh, MacArthur Foundation came in, we would have had difficulty imagining would be possible. But there is a lot of other collaboration that is taking place in Milwaukee around criminal justice reform. We probably wouldn't have received the support of the MacArthur Foundation if we weren't committed to doing that. And we are you know, committed to doing it um, in every way we possibly can. Having said all that, um, and speaking with a bit of gratitude for the cooperation and help that people are giving, I really want to speak to two other values that I think are really important. Uh, one is humility. The depth of the problems that the clients that we represent face and the problems that have been created through years of criminal justice policy and other kinds of social policy are really profound. And we are making lots of progress and really committed to making Milwaukee a place that, that we can stand up and say it changed its history because of its commitment to reform. But we know what a huge undertaking that is and how many people have to be brought into the work together for that to be successful. But our, in spite of this, that sense of humility and being somewhat daunted by the size of the problems, I really want to highlight the hopefulness and the optimism that we have to bring to this work. The country is in a bad way. There are a lot of challenges that we face. But the fact of the matter is that we have it within our capacity to do so much better for so many people and affect and change lives. And I think that's what brings me to the work is that sense of possibility that it can be much better and it can be much better soon if we all come together and work hard at it. Absolutely, thank you so much, Tom. Sean, would you go next, please? Thank you um, for having me here, Brother Ronald. Um, you know, my story is is similar. There's there's differences to my brother Khalif Mouabel, um, who I owe a lot to as far as getting into this work. Um, I wasn't, you know, I didn't get incarcerated. Well, first let me let me uh, identify who I represent. Um, my day job is I work for an organization called For Our Future Wisconsin, um, and I created my own company, Conduit LLC, which is about advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, eradicating uh, disparities and in inequities um, in all systems. Uh, and I started my first contact with the criminal justice system was in my teenage years. Uh, I was incarcerated for the first time when I was 21 going on 22. Um, and it, that led to like a 17 year odyssey, you know, in and out um, with the correctional system, adult correctional system and probation and parole. And most of the times I was being returned to the system for nothing but probation violations, not even committing new crimes. Um, so admittedly, I was a guy that talked about uh, the issues and disparities and inequities and things like that. You know, I sat around and ran my mouth for a long time. Um, and when I finally started to do something, you know, the brother Khalif Mouabel, he was very um, instrumental in that, you know, um, when we, met for met up for the second time because we we met for the first time when we were on totally different paths but when we met for the second time he was already on this path um and had made some considerable headway so that that in turn made a great impression on me and i got directed into this work and just leadership um organizations like just leadership aclu um expo you know were instrumental in um, like Khalid, providing a plethora of mentors, 
a plethora of mentors um, and just a lot of people that were instrumental in opening the doors and creating opportunities and getting me to this space right now, so. Thank you, Sean, appreciate it. We have one more amazing panelist for you. Kent, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure, thanks, <clears throat> thanks Ronald. I'm, I'm Kent Lovern. I work in the DA's office. I'm the Chief Deputy District Attorney here from Milwaukee County. I'm finishing my uh, 23rd year as a prosecutor. And I, I became a prosecutor years ago because uh, I wanted to serve the community that I lived in. Um, I moved into the administration of the DA's office uh, back at the beginning of 2007, so almost 14 years now. Um, and the reason I moved into that and wanted to move into that uh, was because I really wanted to uh, help develop strategies that would um, address the root causes of crime, um, uh, a number of struggles in our community as a whole. I didn't want to continue to uh, serve as a line prosecutor simply, although I think it's, I value that work obviously tremendously and I think it's important. I felt like I wanted to do some things that were a little bit more proactive and, and, um, and um, building on some things in the community to try to prevent more cases coming into our system. And so, so my day job is I, I administer the office, I oversee the office, all of the management things that go with that. Um, but probably the favorite part of my job is that I get to spend some time um, helping to develop some things in the community as well. As a partner with um, the community, we've certainly have been very supportive of a lot of initiatives around diversions of her prosecutions here in, in our office and in the system over the years that have impacted in a positive way uh, jail and prison population. Um, I've just very much involved in leading the development of the Sojourner Family Peace Center. Again, not to create more cases in the domestic violence courts, but to try to address proactively and more holistically um, the, the struggles people are going through when they're actually seeking help uh, and um, some other projects we, we have that I've been um, work on now over the years. Uh, Milwaukee Urban Stables is a new one that I think we'll hear a lot more about that we've just opened on the near south side that intends to provide um, equine therapy for um, um, people in our community, in the Milwaukee community, um, who are struggling um, with emotional um, or PTSD uh, issues. And it's also going to be a place where we can have some community work done to engagement work uh, done as well. So, so those are the reasons I've stayed in the prosecutor's office here in Milwaukee County. And, um, and I've been grateful to work with so many people in the community um, toward, a, toward a number of these, I think, important important causes. Thank you. Thank you, Kent. Thank you for your contribution. And uh, two things, a couple of housekeeping matters. First, uh, for the audience, if you have questions, feel free to enter them into the chat box and I'll keep an eye on them so we can ask the panelists if you have questions that you'd like to ask them as they're talking. Uh, the second thing, we ha uh, have the uh, honor or the, um, definitely the honor of having one of the national voices in criminal justice reform uh, and is meeting with us, our president of Just Leadership USA, Deanna Hoskins. And she probably gonna kill me this, but I'm gonna invite her to come on and say a couple of words before we get started with the panel. Deanna, would you speak to the audience, please? Oh, maybe she, I see she's on, maybe she's on another call. Well, anyway, if you get a minute, we'll try to invite her back in. But for now, well, let's get to the let's get the panel, to the plenary panel questions. And the first question is around a topic that Tom mentioned around racial equity. The MacArthur Safety and Justice Challenge believes that criminal justice reform must take race, ethnicity, and intersectionality into account at each and every step of the process to ensure equitable outcomes for all people, community advocates, people with lived experience and system actors must collaborate as equal partners in the criminal justice reform process. So the question is, how can the community and the Milwaukee Safety and Justice Challenge Program collaborate to help undo the historic racial injustices within and perpetuated by the criminal justice system and to reduce racial disparities in the system? Who would like to tackle that question first? Go ahead, Sean. Um, I'm a firm believer um, that it's, you know, it, it comes down to um, community and culture. And to, call, to truly cultivate community and culture, it has to start with um, 
And I know a lot of people are, are tired of conversation. They're tired of paying people paying just, you know, just lip service. They want to see um, metrics make met, metrics met. They want to see goals accomplished, you know, um, cause a lot of these issues, we all know everybody on this panel, these are not, in, these are not new issues. Um, we're dealing with issues that have been perpetuated for decades now, if not longer. Um, but it does actually begin with um, conversation and education um, and people's uh, perspectives um, being broadened and expanded. So, you know, that's why it's, it's, it's extremely important um, that, you know, individuals from the prosecutor's office, um, you know, are on these panels um, because with them, you know, having being the people that actually start the process of people's odysseys through the system, I think a form of a form of education, them understanding exactly where these angels, these individuals come from um, and what got, actually got them to that place where they're being prosecuted. Um, like it's not an A to Z. There's a lot of things in between um, that has that happens to an individual over the course of their life when you talk about marginalization, discrimination, um, systemic racism. So I think that's 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 the starting the that should that has to be the um, oil in the engine that drives the engine. So Sean, as a quick follow-up question, you mentioned community culture. Could you speak a little bit more about what you meant when you said community culture? Well, and that's part of, you know, that's part of, you know, what, you know, what I try to do um, in cultivating community and culture. And when you look at um, how systemic racism and discrimination and margin, marginalization, marginalization are perpetuated, um, it really, it really, um, it comes down to white privilege. Um, okay. And that is, that is part of the education I provide is getting an individual, and the only way true community um, can be um, cultivated and culture can be cultivated amongst people of different ethnic groups, you know, they have to understand exactly um, what, why the BIPOC community, Black, Indigenous, people of color, and other historically marginalized groups, why they're in the situation that they're in. And so that's, a, you know, and that comes down to busting that bubble of white privilege. Good, thanks for pointing that out. So any other thoughts around racial equity? What are, what are my other panelists thinking about? What are you, what's bubbling up for you guys around? What's your thoughts around eight racial equity and how can we bridge that gap? Anybody jump in, don't be shy. Yeah, so I can, I'll make a couple of comments. You know, I, I think when I, you know, did the introductory part, I, I said, you know, we really have to do our work effectively inside the criminal justice system. And that work needs to change to acknowledge the problems of racial disparities and inequity, inequities in our criminal justice system. I am you know, deeply impressed, frankly, when I attend community meetings by people who come up to me after the meetings or before the meetings and who really feel that the barriers to getting any kind of help or information about what's happening to somebody that they care about who's in the criminal justice system is very difficult to accomplish. So one simple example of a thing that the system could be better at is being more easily accessible to families and to neighborhoods and people who have questions about it. Um, how we treat people as when they are being screened at the front door of the criminal justice system. And, you know, not just screened in terms of whether in the DA's office there's gonna be a charging decision, but screened just physically when they wanna enter the courthouse for some reason. Things like that have to be done with, in, in a very thoughtful and, 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 um, and, and, and effective way because we communicate from the moment somebody steps into the criminal justice system, unfortunately, some things to them that I think are very disabling. Um, I also think that our criminal justice system somehow has to be more able to hear the voices of the people who are most affected by what happens. We are right now in the middle of a terrible pandemic and you know, we receive in the public defender's office letters from people um, who are in prison and they're very worried because they have health issues and they're worried about what could happen to them from their families who are concerned about somebody who's sitting in prison and who has health concerns. And it's just not that easy for 
you know, people who have those concerns to fully be heard. So to me, those are things inside of our criminal justice system. But I think outside of it is the work that the MacArthur Foundation has, has put forward, that our Community Justice Council has been very actively involved in, which is making it easy for people to come to meetings like this to raise questions and concerns that they have and to um, you know, feel as though they're really being heard. Now, having said all of that, those are kind of what I'll call first level reforms. The deeper level reforms, and I say this sometimes, I would like to really go out of business into public defender's office. I'd like to live in a community where we don't need very many public defenders and prosecutors and criminal judges. Why? Because we are solving people's problems in a more fundamental and helpful way. We are solving housing problems. We're solving substance abuse problems. We're dealing with trauma, which is something we focused on with, with the MacArthur Foundation's assistance. That deeper work requires a you know, retraining of our workforces in a lot of different ways and connecting the criminal justice workforces with many of the people who are on this call who are doing really great work in communities. All of that can be done and it won't overnight fix the problem we have, but I think it'll give us the sense that we're making real progress on it. And, um, and that's what I think we're being called to do. That's what people expect for, from people who sit in positions like mine, that you should be focused on trying to figure out how to make that happen. And so we are. Thank you for your response, Tom. That's, that's very interesting. Ken, I want to put you on the, I want to put you on the spot for just a minute. Um, your boss, John Chisholm, uh, is, is a friend of mine, actually. And I'm not sure how many people in, in this audience actually know. He's one, in my opinion, he's one of the original progressive prosecutors in the country. He was a trailblazer in some of the practices that he, in some of the positions he took as far as running his office. So from your perspective, I'm curious to know or, or hear what are some of the uh, ways you guys are addressing racial disparity in the DA's office as far as, you know, charging people and dealing with people that come through your office and you through the system? Yep. Well, for one thing, the first thing you have to do is you have to measure yourself. You have to, or, or allow someone to come in and measure the work you're doing. And that's something we started, uh, it, it actually started by John's predecessor, but when John first took office in January 2007, we were in the midst of working with the Vera Institute uh, to come into our office and analyze everything in our office, analyze our whole history of charging in the last couple of years before they came in and they, we opened up our entire office to them, case files and outcomes and all of that to make, to have them measure and tell us uh, where disparities uh, would lie in terms of decision making in our office. And, and there were a couple of areas uh, related most primarily to um, possession of drug paraphernalia that won't be a surprise to people and with marijuana, uh, the response to marijuana possession. And we made changes as a result of that in our office and that was in 2007, 2008 as a result of someone coming in from the outside to measure us and telling us what they saw. Again, we've just finished another process of that same type of work. Uh, it was done through the funding by the MacArthur um, Foundation and work done by Don Steeman at Loyola University and Florida International University. Similar situation again to measure our entire office. Um, they come in and take a look at all of our, the work we're doing to, to see uh, disparities in our office and whether they exist or not. I think the other interesting uh, thing this project did recently was they actually interviewed our own prosecutors separately, um, had, had them give surveys and give feedback about what their understanding was about what their role was as a prosecutor and what, 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 was, what should they know about the community and, and are, the, um, are, are there coincidence, for example, coincidences between um, the communities that are um, not connected to resources in Milwaukee and crime rates, and how should we understand that and consider that? And I think that um, I think the the people who came in and reviewed our office produced a report that I think displayed that that there is a growing sense in our office that um, we have to have a better understanding still of what's going on in the community in the larger community and why people come into the system and that that it's directly related to frankly policies that have existed not only in Milwaukee but in every community in the United States for centuries that have disenfranchised people and that have segregated people and that have not given people equal opportunity and as a result 
Um, we have now, um, you know, in areas where there is a lack of opportunity and a lack of education and a lack of investment, um, we have um, struggles with crime. And those two things are directly linked. And, and then we've set up a system, frankly, that was ge geared to react to that, essentially. And what the, the other piece then that I think we can do as an office and what we've tried to do, and something I try to do in my position in the office is talk to the larger community about um, what does it mean to be a safer, healthier community as a whole? And the reality is um, there's a strong belief that if we can rely on police and prosecutors and tough sentencing judges, that we'll be a safer community. The reality of that is that, that we're, that's like comparing a, a good health, a healthy person to how good our emergency system is or how good our surgical doctors are and how, how um, strong our nurses are in times of crisis. That's not going to make us safer and healthier, and we've relied on that um, approach for far too long at, at a cost that has been really destructive to neighborhoods and communities in Milwaukee and other cities. And, and the issue has got to be really at the end of the day, if we want a safer, healthier community, there's got to be uh, broader recognition of this uh, disparity that has existed forever in Milwaukee and throughout America. And there's got to be an investment, uh, an investment in these communities in an effort to sincerely um, give opportunity to people who've just not ever had it. And I think that that's something we can do as an entity, as a, as a public safety entity to say, look, it's not enough. And, and it's, frankly, it can be counterproductive to throw more resources at the back end of a system and expect that somehow it's fairer and safer and healthier for everyone when what we need is much more investment at the front end to help communities build themselves. Just as a quick follow-up question, one of our audience asked, she made the statement and asked the question that transparency is needed in a major way. And you talked about policies and meeting with the community. So I'm curious, could you provide a little more insight into uh, what you guys are doing to be transparent and how you can be more transparent to the community? Sure. We've just um, produced a, a, a dashboard that has just gone on live, and I, I'll make sure I send a link here to everyone uh, that has just literally gone online in the last uh, couple weeks here. As a result of the work done uh, that I most recently referred to by Loyola University, and that is to, to see um, charging rates in the DA's office, conviction rates in the DA's office, um, how do those cut across uh, racial lines as well. And so that's something that the public can now see um, we, we are one of the first DA's offices in the country to have something like this. And it, will it, it is right to be developed even further as we go along here, but um, we do think it's important in this uh, day and age to have that type of information available for people uh, just to see whenever they have the time to view that. Thank you, appreciate it. Before we move to the next question, do any other, either other panelists want to touch on the question of racial equity? Yeah, I'll Definitely. just add that, oh, um, I'm sorry, did I interrupt? No, you go ahead. I've talked no, no, enough. Go ahead. Go ahead, Aaron. Khalifa, come. Okay. Um, so just quickly, um, I just wanted to add here that the foundation actually provided some guidance to all safety and justice challenge sites around racial equity. And so um, both from their input as well as from some other partners um, that are part of the safety and justice challenge, we had pulled together some best practices around how we can tangibly uh, reduce racial and ethnic disparities because like uh, Sean had mentioned, um, you know, Milwaukee is a planning city. We have a lot of conversations, and, but people are really eager to see some accountability and transparency um, and really see some tangible progress on racial and ethnic disparities. So um, going forward, what we'll be looking to do is to engage community members and have them be a part of some decision point analysis. So we would like to dig deeper into our data. You know, we have a sense of sort of what our jail population looks like. Um, but what we want to do is really dig into each part of our system and figure out to what extent disparities are happening, what those disparities look like, and really put some numbers to it, and then figure out what decisions are being made at each of those decision points. Um, so that we're not, you know, talking broadly about racial and ethnic disparities, and that we're really targeting the things that are specifically driving disparities in our system. So I think being a part of that kind of data dive is something that we'll be looking to do bringing in community members and people with lived experience. We want to have people that have been through the system be a part of those conversations as well. Um, we're also looking to include more community members in um, our, make our safety and justice challenge and CJC work groups. Um, so we definitely want to have community members be a part of the conversations about priorities around racial and ethnic disparities and what needs to happen next. 
in that area. Uh, we've talked about doing training. A lot of sites have gone to do implicit bias trainings um, and you know, people kind of go back and forth about the efficacy of those trainings. Um, it is a possibility that we could do implicit bias training, but I do think there is a need for training, both for community members so that they better understand how the system works and feel more comfortable being around the table talking about the nuts and bolts of the criminal justice system, but also for system stakeholders so that they understand um, how race shows up in the criminal justice system and what they can do to be a part of dismantling systemic racism in the criminal justice system. So I think that's another area where, you know, it could be implicit bias training, it could be a different training that we think is more um, appropriate to the situation in Milwaukee, but that's another opportunity where community members can be a part of the conversation to help us identify what that training needs to look like. Uh, I will add too, though, is that a lot of that sounds like the CJC calling you to us. So it's, you know, bringing community members into our work groups and our work and what we want to do. But we also have to recognize, and to borrow Tom's word of humility, recognize that we, this can't just be transactional. It can't just be us asking the community to come to us. We have to be coming to the community with resources and responding to the needs of the community. So that's another place where we're looking to the community to tell us what you want to see. This shouldn't just be the system deciding what happens around racial and ethnic disparities. It should also be community members being a part of identifying what they need and what they want to see. Thank you, Erin. Khalid, what are your thoughts on racial equity? Well, first and foremost, I believe that we have a hard time with having courage for the truth. We don't really like the truth being put out there very blatantly and very raw. And I think that creating a space where the powers that be is uncomfortable or uncomfortable, that's okay. Because that's when things start to change. Um, it's not possible for, I don't believe that it's possible for a system that has been corrupt for so many years to fix itself when it's so entrenched in that corruption. That particular, those, the, the, the idea of reform, the idea of a revolution has to come from outside and it has to come from the directly impacted so that they can lend some type of context to what's really going on. Milwaukee has the race disparity, the worst racial disparity, one of the worst racial disparities in the country. It's one of the worst places in the, in the country for so-called African-American people to live. Worst place to live, the worst place to raise a so-called African-American child. Per capita has the most people in prison than anywhere in the country. We're talking about Milwaukee, Wisconsin. These disparities, like somebody said, I believe it was Ken that said it, don't just happen overnight. Of course, of course, this kind of a system has been entrenched in this kind of disparity and this kind of atrocity for so many, 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 many years. And one of the things that I see is there's a thing called a prison industrial complex, but there's also a thing called nonprofit industrial complex and the people that got the money, the people that have the money, they are more comfortable with funneling the money through organizations that they deem to be safe as opposed to an organization that is somewhat like mine, like directly impacted people making a difference in the community. We're reaching for the impacted and we're liberating their voices and we're providing a voice to the voiceless. Also, the people who are on the inside who are inspired by the work that we do, that's all part of reform. And it's all part of reform in the system, but those particular things don't really get, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't get the kind of uh, credibility and it's not looked at as a real service because the people with the textbook smarts and the people with the certifications and this and the certifications and that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's sanctioned to work with these directly impacted people who are closest to the problem, but farthers away from the, and closest to the solution, but farthers away from the resources. These people aren't looked at as viable resources. And one of the reasons why we press the mayor of Madison to implement some programs around what we call peer support, peer, spe uh, peer mediation, and peer specialists is because they were refusing to even look at what peers can do to another peer. 
the impact on the lives that peers can have on other peers. I myself am a product of a variation of peers. And those peers are the people who allow me to see myself, challenge me on the things that no one else could challenge me on because I have the excuse that you don't know where I've been type thing. Some excuses we take away automatically when we look at the work that we do out here. Like we on the ground right now, I'm at another event at the same time I'm on this call around the prison, the, uh, the, 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 the police reform. We got all of the families up here in Milwaukee right now. The police in Wauwatosa have gone mad. They're beating up our people, doing all kinds of things. So my point is this. We got to call a spade a spade. This is a very racist, segregated city. And it's not racist because it's segregated. I want to be very clear about that. The city is not racist because it's segregated. The city is racist because when I go into West Dallas, Shorewood Hills, all of these other places, Whitefish Bay, they have a beautiful community and that community have businesses in the community that feeds the community. In our community, everybody that's not from our community takes away from our community and leave us impoverished. Now, the sister said, Aaron made a very good point. We always set up these programs, projects, resolutions, planning committees and everything else and we expect the community to respond to the call to respond to the request. But who is it that you have out there canvassing, educating, and what kind of face are you putting on these particular programs, projects, planning sessions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to reach the people? The people aren't gonna respond to something that's not familiar to them because up to this point, the various systems that are designed to help us, the various systems that are designed to give us assistant, assistance are the various systems that keep us oppressed and keep us down and put all of these injunctions on us that makes it more difficult for us to have some kind of success or some type of potential for success. And when we look at how this, uh, the parole system is set up in Wisconsin, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's no, way, there's no way possible that you can get sentenced to five years in the state of Wisconsin and end up doing 25 years on papers. Every time you go back to prison in Wisconsin, they start your time all the way over. You know, so these are the things that we need to really think about. You know, if we're really gonna talk about reform, reform has to happen. And uh, I'm being cut off, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, pass, on, pass, pass the mic. Thank you, Minister. We appreciate your comments and definitely take them to heart. And I'm hoping that the, the stakeholders here hear what you had to say. And speaking about, uh, you talked about money and community reinvestment. That's a good segue into our next question around community reinvestment. There's a lot of discussion, not just in Milwaukee, but around the country around uh, community reinvestment as far as criminal just money for criminal justice reform, jails and prisons. Uh, Milwaukee is currently in the next, uh, applying for the next cycle of grant funding of $1.3 million in the next round of funding from the MacArthur Foundation. So I'm curious from our community panelists, how would you like to see that money spent in your community? If you had an opportunity to, to, to help guide that process, what would you like to see? And that's, that's basically for Sean and, and the minister. I got cut off. I can't, uh, I just came back in. So I didn't even hear the beginning of the question, brother. Okay, okay I, was just, I was asking, Milwaukee is about to in the process of applying for $1.3 million in their next round of grant funding. And so you as a community member, I was asking how would the community like to see that money spent as far as criminal justice reform? Is he going, is Kali going? Go ahead, Sean. He must be, I think he having, I think he having issues. Okay. I'm back. I'm back. One last time, brother. Pardon the body. Hold up. Go ahead, Sean. Oh, um, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, uh, Minister Khalif Mouabel, he really, um, if you really listen to everything that he said, he really addressed um, this question. He really addressed two questions in one. 
I mean, you know, it, it kind of goes back to the conversation that we were having the other day when you were introducing me to this event, uh, Brother Ronald. Uh, there has to be money. You know, I don't have any particular program or anything in mind, or I don't have any, you know, um, you know, I, I can't think off the top of my head how to reinvent the wheel that's, you know, that's already there. I know this, though, that when it comes to true criminal justice reform, when we're talking about making sure individuals do not go back once they get out, there has to be money allotted for people, you know, to be able to be self-sufficient. And when I mean self-sufficient, they have to be able to have obtain a livable wage. You know, I think it's three things. It comes down to a livable wage, housing, um, and mental and physical care. Um, those were well, really four things, but um, there has to be money allotted for that because, you know, and I don't want to open up any old wounds, but, you know, have, I, I told you some of the organizations that I originally allotted with now, now listen, I'm really put um, aligned with, I, you know, <laughs> put, cause I'm working for an organization right now. It's all about, you know, voting and engaging um, constituents about, you know, the importance of requesting absentee ballot and things like that. Don't get me wrong, voting is extremely important. You know, I've never been against voting, but you know, when Expo originally rolled out, you know, their initiative, you know, for, you know, um, that was aligned with voting, I didn't have any problem with that. But the only thing that the only wisdom that I was trying to impart on them, having been someone, and the minister knows this well, because um, he's seen my struggle, you know, having been someone that had to get out and start from nothing, you know, we're not even talking about ground zero, we're talking about ground negative something, and trying to get on my feet. Um, I was just all, all I was trying to get them to see is that if you really want, you know, restoring rights, you know, to voting rights to felons, if you really want to get, you know, um, you know, brothers and sisters that have been incarcerated before, if you really want to get them energized and get them to the polls and, you know, and, and not only for national elections, for local elections, they have to, you know, it's hard to hear or the echo of your empty pocket. You know, it's when, when, when you're not able to feed yourself, when you're not able, when you don't have a roof over your head um, or you don't, you know, you don't have an income coming in every month. Um, it's just hard to stay focused on these other issues. And, you know, like Khalif was saying, I mean, that's act, that's by, you know, that's not accidental. You know, that's, you know, that's on purpose. That's what systemic racism is um, and inequities and disparities are, you know, and that's how you keep people marginalized. So anyway, this money has to be reinvested. You know, I wish I, wish I had, uh, uh, I just know that. I wish I had an actionable plan or I was able to address you know, how the program should be structured, but there has to be money allotted for individuals to attain, a, a, you know, those type of resources. Is, minister, is the minister, Khalif, are you still on the line or did we lose you? I thought I, thought I saw him. No, no, okay. no, 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 I'm here. I'm here. Did you want, did you uh, want to do that before I pass it to the... Yeah, yeah, real quick. Uh, so one of the things that really helped me when I came home, and remember, when I came home, I had... I had I did 15 years in prison from the age of 15. So essentially, I came home with, the 50, with a 15-year-old mindset, essentially. And so that means that I didn't know how to pay bills. I didn't know how to do um, the basic things that the regular or normal adult would probably know how to do had they been on the streets um, for that particular period of time. So one of the things that really helped me, um, one of the things that really helped me transition successfully back into the community was the impact of peers and the people that I saw that had already been through the storm that had came through it and survived it and made the struggle look good. You get what I'm saying? And that inspired me to also get on this path. Now, when I embarked on this journey, what I, what I came to learn was, was that the people who were behind the scenes, who had us working in criminal justice reform, who had us advocating for change of systemic racism, prison and industrial complex, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These people were getting six figure salaries while they were giving us stipends. While I was struggling to pay child support and struggling to pay um, bills and basic necessities and things of that nature, they had designed a whole career off the backs of our struggle. Now, once I understood that, I started to get smart and I started to 
develop my own kind of initiative and I started to perpetuate that into the community and I started to affect other people and I got a bunch of directly impacted people together and we started to make a difference on our own for our own people. Now, I said that to say this, the dollars that are invested, if we could get, if I could be at a point where I know every Tuesday about 15 to 20 brothers are coming home or women are coming home from prison. Give us access to these people. When you're dealing with people who have already been through it and have been successful in the impact that they're making on the community, give us access to these people. Give us the resources to work with these people and vet them a different way before the streets get a hold of them before we do. Give us an opportunity to invest in our people and show them the ropes of successful integration back into the community and give us the resources to make sure that we're not asking them to volunteer their services when they just come home and they haven't even got their feet on the ground yet. Because one of the things that was always hanging over my head was, dang, how I'm going to pay my bills. Yeah, I was on TV. Yeah, I was in front of communities and I was able to be on panels and do all of these different discussions. But at the back end, I'm still struggling to transition successfully and other things is on my mind. So to set those particular things at ease, we have to be ever vigilant about how we re-enter, how we, how, how we, how we work on re-entry, how we invest in the pool of re-entry resources and who that investment is in and what that investment looked like. That's my piece. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Aaron, as a representative of the, of, of the SJC, and, and you, I know you guys got the uh, application pending for the next funding, what are you, what are you, what are your, uh, some of your insights you could share with the audience around how you plan to implement and spend some of that money? Yeah, I think this round of funding is focused on sustainability. Um, so the foundation is really looking at scaling back the amount of money that they're providing and looking to sites to embed what they've already done into the system. Um, one, so I mean, working on the application, originally we were putting a lot of things in there that had already been done, but we knew we wanted to do additional work around racial equity. So we included a separate racial equity strategy in there so that it was explicit, so that it couldn't you know, fall to the wayside or not be a priority. Uh, so the strategies that you saw earlier in blue, among them going into the sustainability phase, racial equity will be its own articulated strategy. So that's just to make sure that we're really um, investing in that work and really focused on that work and it doesn't end up sitting on the back burner um, relative to other strategies. I'm glad that Sean, you had mentioned wanting to do some planning around um, investments in reentry. Um, and I also appreciate your comments as well, Khalif, um, around investments in reentry. Um, you know, coming to the system as someone who has a perspective of someone who has worked on sort of a policy side of it. And as someone who, you know, is connected to it in a way that I myself have not been involved in the system, but I've had family members who have been involved in it. Um, so I'm not the best person in the same way that Sean and Khalif are to speak to what the specific needs are once someone comes out of the system. That's information that really needs to come from people that have been directly impacted and who have that firsthand experience with the system. And so in the next phase, we're hoping to do some strategic planning with community members and with people with lived experience to identify what those priorities are. Um, since MacArthur Foundation is looking to scale back the funding so that we're really stepping up and either embedding our work into local funds, so whether it's the county, state, um, getting other foundation support or other like federal funding, looking to other sources to be able to bring funds in to keep this work going. Um, we have had local funders approach us about, you know, where can we invest and support the work of the CJC and the SJC, and I think this is a perfect opportunity for us um, to look forward and look at, you know, where are some local resources that we can put towards some reentry priorities that are identified by people in the community and also by people um, with lived experience. And again, I think that people like Sean and Khalif are really the ones um, and other individuals that are on this call or other people that we have yet to reach. Um, who would be in the best position to tell us, like, these are the areas that you know, I really struggled with as I came back out, out into the community, and here are some areas that we can prioritize so that when we're going after funding, we're not just kind of casting a wide net, but we're really going towards the things that 
we know have been the most important and the most impactful for people that have had that system experience. So I think the planning is going to be necessary so that we can prioritize, but I think there's a lot of opportunities for us as an SJC going forward, just thinking about sustainability to bring other um, resources and to support things that are identified by people who are directly impacted. Just real briefly, I want to give, I'm going to give uh, Ken and Tom opportunity. I know you guys may not get SJC funding, but I'm just curious. I know you get, you know, funding to run your offices. What are your funding priorities or spending priorities from the budget that you guys get in each of your offices? Yeah, the, excuse me. I, I appreciate that. The, the needs of our office that are being um, paid for by the uh, Safety and Justice Challenge relate specifically to deferred prosecution agreements and diversions and keeping people out of the system. So we have attorneys that are funded through the grant to do that work. Um, it's important work. It, uh, they're not adding more cases. They're not bringing more people into the system. The whole idea, their whole full-time job essentially is to identify people who uh, could use drug treatment, could use mental health intervention, don't even you know, need to be in our system, maybe even something less than that. You know, it could be something even, even less of an intervention, but that's their full-time job essentially. And those are positions paid for by the, um, by the Safety and Justice Challenge Grant. I would add that um, in terms of long-term sustainability, we actually um, received uh, some money from the state a year ago in the last budget, two, the last two year cycle. And what we asked for was to, to make more permanent positions in our office to do that type of work. So over time we've reduced, for example, the number of drug prosecutors we have in our office, and we've increased the number of prosecutors who do this type of work, who are, who are channeling people out of the system and who are um, uh, essentially uh, trying to connect people to, to treatment resources essentially is what we're seeking um, for those who need it. And so that's what our office is essentially um, being funded for from the SJC grant. Thank you. What about, so, you? what about you, Kent? I mean, Tom, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll just make a couple quick comments. I thought Kent gave us a nice analogy to what, how our system works when he talked about hospitals. And, you know, there are the criminal justice system is like the hospital for a lot of the social problems that we have. And, and of course, you want to have a better hospital and you want to have a hospital that does not immediately throw everybody in that doesn't need to be in it into the intensive care unit, you know, which is kind of what we used to do. Um, so all these efforts around the front end of the criminal justice system to uh, use diversions, to use treatment courts, to allow our lawyers, which our state statute allows us to do, to appoint lawyers when people are not charged around the country. A lot of public defenders don't see clients until they're actually charged with an offense. We have the capacity to meet people before they're charged and work out these agreements. You know, that remains in tremendously important. But when I look at the, you know, two questions, you know, two and three community reinvestment and community-based programs, I want to just comment on what everyone seemed to identify as one of the really critical areas we'd like to work on, which is the failure of our system to support people who come back into the community after having been in the criminal justice system and then find themselves, you know, repeatedly getting, you know, put into custody on a probation or extended supervision hold. And many of them end up going back into the prison system because of things that they could have avoided if they had had some people helping them. The Community Justice Council has a very active reentry council. Again, speaking in the most humble possible terms, this brings people together to try to talk about strategies to help provide the support it's not in and of itself capable of providing that support. But I do think that, you know, what has been said already about finding people at their most vulnerable point, which is often coming out of prison, yeah. and really giving them the support they need so that they can succeed, that will do a lot to drive down, you know, these re-entries into prison, which are so expensive in every possible way, you know, in human terms, in family terms, in neighborhood terms, and frankly, just in, in the amount of money it takes to, you know, to run the system. So I think we can be hopeful that if we can pull ourselves together, we can support people in, in very meaningful ways. I mean, it's inspiring to hear people on this call talk about how they went through one of the worst possible experiences and come out with this tremendous commitment to serving our community. 
that's okay. more of what it is. So those are just a few thoughts. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for your thoughts. And, and I, I commend our community speakers as well because they did have to overcome some huge obstacles to even be at the place they are now to be able to present in this manner. And I appreciate that. And that, that's a perfect segue into our, our next question. Our next topic I'd like to touch on briefly is about community-based programs. And the question is, what are the big, biggest obstacles faced when trying to establish community-based programs? And I want to bring in a question from the audience along that same line. Um, Sister Benny Bay asks, how can her organization, United as One, located in Kenosha, help with with this whole process because they get a lot of people from Milwaukee and their organization want to help the people get established uh, back into the community. So what would you guys say to her? Why, how can she be involved? And what's the obstacles for her first? And then how can she overcome some of those obstacles? Well, one thing I can say just to maybe to get the conversation started on this is I do think solving a lot of these problems is about relationships. And I do think that for all the obstacles that we face in terms of, of racism and racial, you know, insensitivity and, and sort of silos, various things, I do think that our Community Justice Council has really attempted to be a gathering spot for a lot of people who want to work on these issues. And the re-entry committee or council is got probably 50 or 60 people who are participants in it. And that would be a great meeting. It's easy to attend, especially on you know the Zoom world that we're in. And I think you could meet a lot of the people who would be potentially helpful allies, you know, to you know connecting the people you're helping in Kenosha to the people here in Milwaukee who want to provide services. So that's at least one modest suggestion I would make. Thank you. Aaron, I'm curious to hear from your, from your perspective, from the SJC's perspective, how could this purchase organization in Kenosha get involved in the work that you guys are doing? Or how, I mean, how can there be a, a meeting of the minds, so to speak, a collaboration? You know, I will just, I feel a, a need to really own the fact that historically I have not done as much community engagement as I should and that's just something that I just need to own up in this space that it's just as part of the state it's part of the community justice council and the project manager who oversees uh, the safety and justice challenge you know that's that's part of my responsibilities to engage the community and especially people who are directly impacted and so you know, as far as further engaging with people, I am happy to have conversations with people. My contact information is on our website. I'll actually also include it in the chat box. Um, so if at any point people wanna ask questions about the safety and justice challenge or how they can be involved, um, by all means, you can reach out to me and I will share that contact information. I think going forward, um, I'll be looking for opportunities with our work groups to get more people integrated into those um, so that people can be a part of the priority setting and the conversations around the safety and justice challenge. Um, so I think our work groups that do the implementation of our strategies, those are opportunities. I think the racial equity work and doing some of that decision point analysis, that's an opportunity for people who are interested in being a part of the work. Um, the CJC of course has its monthly meetings of the whole um, so people can definitely come to those, but you know, overall, they're just. I think both Mandy and I would both agree that the CJC could be doing more to engage people um, in the community and especially people with lived experience. So, um, if there are other ways that people think that the CJC could be doing better outreach, myself and Mandy would be open to that um, for sure. So, I would say definitely, if you want to be a part of the SJC, if you want to be part of the CJC, I'll include our contact information in the chat box and feel free to connect with us. But like I said earlier, I don't just want it to be come to us. Um, I also want to come to you. So if there are things that I can do to be helpful to you, please let me know. Um, and to the best of my ability, I will work with you to make sure that you stay apprised of what we're doing. That's, that's great. That sounds like a great opportunity. Ken, I'm just curious. I mean, I know there's, it's always kind of a different process for the DA's office to engage the community. I'm just curious, do you guys run any type of uh, community listening sessions or focus groups or what type, what type of engagement are you, are you doing or are you open to do with the community? Yeah, absolutely. Well, for um, 
a number of years now. I, I want to say 20 years ago, we started with uh, prosecutors who actually work in the community, and that started with two prosecutors about 20 years ago. Um, John Chisholm, after he was elected in 2006, expanded that to a prosecutor in every single police district, um, meaning that uh, that prosecutor's full-time job is working in that police district, and they're paired usually with um, community groups within the district, and, um, and that's their full-time job, is essentially working with uh, groups within the community to identify what the priorities are in neighborhoods to act as a liaison between um, police and uh, neighborhood groups to try to find out what the concerns are related to the neighborhoods themselves. And um, so those prosecutors in particular, their full-time job is in, in the community that they serve directly. And um, so I think, that's been, I think that's been certainly an important piece for our office in, in, in terms of the education of other, others of our prosecutors in the office. And those are, those are highly sought out positions in our office because um, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for people to really get to have a better understanding of, of the neighborhoods and the communities that we're serving. Um, the only other thing I did want to mention is I wanted to support what I heard Khalif say earlier about um, funding for organizations that uh, may be really directly on the front line of providing services, but that may not be getting the big grants from foundations here in Milwaukee, for example. And I, I've heard this at other meetings. I've heard this at foundation meetings I've been to. Uh, um, Fred Royal was part of a group that was really uh, talking about this in a large way. And I, I, my hope would be for this um, not huge amount of money that we have, but, but an amount of money of almost $200,000 that that would be given to community groups. I think, I think it ought to go to the types of um, work that, and the types of groups providing the work that Khalif was describing. And then I think the idea would be that even if that funding amount isn't enough to do, to capture all of the work that's being done, for example, by an organization that would come forward, then I think that, then what we would wanna do is, is to the extent we can be supportive of that, have that money be leveraged by other larger foundations in the community that give routinely to other organizations and, and nonprofits in, um, in Milwaukee. And that this could be at least a starting point for organizations that are doing really good work to be able then to go to other big foundations that are consistently giving millions of dollars within Milwaukee to say, hey look, um, this is something MacArthur gave us because this is good work we're doing and you ought to fund us also. So I think there's an opportunity here for us to go beyond the money that MacArthur is giving us for this work to leverage that um, into greater community support from the larger foundations here in Milwaukee. Thank you, Ken. I'm sure the organizations on the ground would be interested in having that conversation. And to that, to that end, I, was, I would love to hear what the minister and Sean have to say around what are the biggest obstacles you face when trying to establish community-based community programs and uh, events? You know, well, um, oh, brother, oh, yeah, excuse me, brother, part of the body. Um, yes, sir. I just, I don't know if this directly answers the question, but I believe this needs to be said and heard. Um, and admittedly, I probably should have said this a lot earlier when you asked another question. But when, you know, while doing this work, while I've been on my path, you know, I've had, I've been very fortunate. I've been very blessed to sit in different types of meetings, be around different types of individuals doing this work. Um, and what I've noticed, in, and this is, it's not a new phenomenon, um, is that in August, when you look at August, and don't be fooled, we're in another great movement. When you look at, if you look back over the arc of history, um, within all great movements, there's always different perspectives and different ideologies and just different tactics and um, people having different um, ideas about how to tackle an issue. Um, and usually what happens is instead of cooperation and collaboration and strategic, uh, strategic partnership, you know, for the better good, um, it, call, it causes a rift and divide. Uh, and I noticed that, so, you know, when you look at what we're talking about today, you know, criminal justice reform uh, or any, um, you know, form of systemic racism uh, within this country, you know, there has to be, cause like, you know, like, it's been said a few times, like this is not a new, these are not new issues that we're talking about. You know, we're, we're actually, we're talking about issues that 
they were talking about 50 years ago. So there has to be innovative ways um, of going about it um, and different things tried. And one of the things I dropped it in the chat is that you would be surprised. Like, you know, I even, you know, doubted myself, you know, along this path, um, you know, thinking sometimes, you know, that it was an exercise in futility, but like, lo and behold, you know, I have people's ears right now that are business owners that the issues that we're talking about, the communities that, you know, we, we've had identified, especially when it comes to the BIPOC community um, that needs the most resources um, when it comes to marginalization, systemic racism, like they really want to know how they can make a difference, you know, how that they can, you know, but the first part is the education to, for them to understand exactly what the problem is. Um, and so when I, so no, so really what I'm trying to say is you know, when you have these type of meetings, um, you know, especially, you know, one, the one of the reentry council, you know, just things of that nature, um, we have to start inviting, you know, not only the, you know, the key stakeholders and the people that are, you know, normally showing up for the conversation, we have to start reaching out to some of the other people um, that are normally not part of this conversation. I mean, it, when it goes back to that's how community is cultivated. Um, and there has to be an and like I said, there just has to be innovative approaches. You know, like I know, you know, one of my, you know, two of my brothers that have done federal time, you know, that have created a platform where they're using technology, you know, to, um, you know, they're creating, creating a technology, you know, a, a platform, you know, for business owners to be able to, you know, better understand how this person that's formerly been incarcerated can impact, you know, their organization or their business um, you know, their, their bottom line, the value that they can add, just things like that. But it's just that, you know, what, you know, from my perspective, you know, and it could, it could just be my perspective. Nobody else on this call may see it this way. I just see like, you know, what the brother Khalif was identifying, like, you know, every, a lot of people, they have their own agenda. They look at, you know, the problem in one way. And it's like, it's like clicks, you know, it's almost like, like, like high school clicks, you know, um, where, we're over here, you guys are over there, and there's just no cooperation. And and what ends up happening is the resources um, that are needed, you know, don't get, you know, um, um, issued out um, proportionally. Well, thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Before we go to the breakout session, I want to get a last word on this question to Minister Khalif before we go to the breakout sessions. Uh, Khalif, what's your, what's your thoughts around the biggest obstacles to establishing community-based programs? Well, the, the biggest obstacle is for us, like we've done over 700 community events. We've served over 10,000 people over a period of 10 years. And we've had a, we have about a good 90% success rate. Um, the people that we engage, we keep them engaged. We usher them into leadership and we cultivate their core potential so that they maximize their uh, personal potential. But uh, the exhaustion of resources is one of the biggest obstacles that we run up against because we'll get a process started, we'll get people going, and then five months later or three months down the line, we've gotten them used to a certain kind of flow of resources and then those resources have to be cut abruptly and we have to go back to the drawing board to figure out how we can reestablish those resources and bring in more resources. So the impact that's being had on the community is being stifled and the progress in advancing the cause of decarceration is also being stifled in a process of lack of resources. In a day and age where we talk about uh, research data, um, data impact statements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, well, the real work is getting done by the boots on the ground, people who are rolling up their sleeves, getting in there, getting in the mud and making sure that we that we bring our people to safety and we keep them there. That work is very much so undervalued and underappreciated. And because of the practices that we ensue or the tactics that we use are not evidence-based by a university or sanctioned by a university or anything like that. It comes from lived experience. That's something that you can't sanction and put a certificate on. It's something that we just know innately based on our experience, what needs to be done. And that needs to be respected in the same kind of way that uh, a diploma or a certification is to be expected because these people 
are vetted through a system of education. We're vetted through a system of experience. If you bring those two initiatives collaboratively, to, collaboratively together, then we have a more robust system and flow of resources for our people to be more successful in their transition and back into the communities and keeping people out here. Thank you so much. That's 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 a powerful powerful thought you just shared with us. Now I'm sure that the audience got something from. I hope the 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 uh, stakeholders take away from what you were just saying and apply it to the processes in which they do. So at this time we're going to break. We're going to take ten minutes and break ten between twenty fifteen break. minutes and break into the breakout rooms. And when you go into the breakout rooms, you're going to have one of the panelists going to be a facilitator, and I need somebody to volunteer to be a note taker. So when we get back out of the uh, breakout rooms, you can report back to the audience or to the, to the group uh, what the conversation was, what the takeaways was for the group. And so and while you're in there, give everybody opportunity to speak. Don't over talk each other. Be polite. Agree to disagree. And let's have a robust conversation around the issues that we've discussed to this point. Erica, would you take the groups into the breakout room, please? Yes, and everybody, you will receive a link or a button to click on to join the breakout room. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom, I don't know if you and Kent have been assigned to a breakout room. Do you guys have a choice? <laughs> Any place is fine, Ronald. <laughs> yeah, wherever you think would be best, you know, where we could be the most helpful. Okay, Erica, play. Erica, send you guys into one of the breakout rooms. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> what about you? You staying out? Uh, what's what's the group with the smallest number? How many people in the smallest group? Uh, five. COVID. Okay, put me in that one. Okay. And how long did you want this to last? Uh, till. Hold on, give me one second. I, on my time sheet, I said seven forty. Yeah. Um, let's make it seven forty-three. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Yep. All right. Set 10 minute timer. Oh, welcome back, everybody. Welcome back. I apologize for the technical difficulties we experienced in a couple of the rooms. I hope everybody, you know, rolled with the punches and we're keeping it moving. Uh, the, the, we're going to do report outs now. We're going to have each group kind of report out on what the, what the takeaways were from the conversation that we have within each of the groups. And the racial equity group, who's going to report out for that one? Um, I guess, I guess I will. Go ahead, Sean. I mean, unless somebody else from the group wants to share out. Bianca, do you want to share out? <laughs> sure. Um, I think I'll, um, let, I'll let somebody else talk. Thank you. In our group, um, uh, you cut us short a little bit. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> so in our group, we uh, we talked about uh moving from conversations to action. Um, I, I gave a quote, um, Albertstein has said, um, quoted being said, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different solution yeah. um, and outcome. And we have been having these conversations that we know of for the past six, you know, 30 to 60 years. We are dealing with a 400 year journey of black people trying to gain liberation in the United States of America. And, and this is me saying this, um, there has to be a point when we put that, we stop 
reading books, going to trainings, and actually begin to work side by side with individuals like Sean and Khalif and allow them access to living wages within these organizations so that they are able to make they are able to make an impact on the budgets that go out. The situation that we're dealing with has a lot to do with our state, city, and county budgets. Mm -hmm. And so if these individuals are not around the table when these budgets are being said for, um, we miss an opportunity to actually make a dent in the progress that we need to make. Thank you for sharing that, Bianca. That's a great report out. Uh, the second group was community reinvestment. Who was who? Out, who going to do the report out for community reinvestment? I Don't. facilitated. Um, Don't die. I facilitated, so I can quickly recap what we had covered. We were anticipating a little bit more time, so we didn't get to make it through our group. But we had talked a lot about um, the needs community organizations have when in supporting people who are returning to the community. And, um, you know, we discussed things such as uh, mental health needs, working with landlords who can assist in transportation, um, and just some of those uh, basic life needs to present, prevent people from returning to incarceration. Um, but what our, uh, our lovely contributor did not articulate was really the need um, to fund the organizations that do all of those connection services. I think um, so often um, funding direct service providers is really important, but then also those na the navigation is also really important. Those experts who know how to kind of navigate what can be a really difficult system and be supportive of those that are returning to the community. So. That would be my summarization. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you so much for your feedback. Uh, the third group was community-based programs and what were the biggest obstacles to establishing? I was in that, in that particular, I was facilitating that discussion before we had technical difficulties. So I'll speak briefly on what we shared. Um, one, of the, one of the participants in that group talked about losing their job, but still having needs. Um, I'm sorry, this is the COVID-19 one, I'm sorry. The COVID-19 group talked about lo losing their job because of COVID-19, but still having needs. But they discovered that they were able to, uh, through the virtual process, they refigured out how to do, do work that they do and engage more people in their community on the ground through the virtual platforms. And going forward, um, they see that as a way to be more effective and more efficient in the work that they do. I think a lot of us has kind of discovered that through Zoom calls and virtual platforms and what, we, what we've been forced to do since the COVID-19 process has taken place is to be, is to reinvent and reimagine ourselves in the way that we do our work. So that's basically the, one of the biggest takeaways from the COVID-19 panel. And from the community-based programs, we talked about um, having access to the, uh, as, we, as we had on the panel discussion, having access to the resources. Because as we talk about a just leadership, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest away from resources, power, and opportunity. And the community-based uh, program group talked about being in closer proximity to the resources that make them more effective on the ground, more, more effective in their communities, and to make them more equal in their community. That's one way to bridge some of that racial equity gap to bring the resources to the people that's most marginalized and most needed. So going forward, they would like to see more engagement between the community organizations and, and platform between them and the community stakeholders, such as the SJC, the DA's office, and the prosecutor's office. So anybody got any uh, closing thoughts before we go to the, uh, before we go to the uh, um, survey section, any call to actions? Anybody have any call to actions they'd like to share with the group? Khalif, you have any call to actions? Sean? My call to action. You, you breaking up, Minister. We can't hear you. Can you hear me? Barely. Go ahead. 
Hello? Yeah, can you hear us? Okay, we're going to go to Sean while we're waiting. Can you hear me? Are you there? Can you hear us? Go ahead, Sean. Uh, my, the only call to action I have is just, you know, um, I said it earlier, um, you know, um, on the panel, and I was, you know, I was, got to reiterate it, you know, during the breakout room while talking to um, those people with all those, <laughs> talking to people with all those other wonderful perspectives. My only, no, the only, the only call to action I have is for everybody on here is to, you know, um, when I talk about innovative approach and, and, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to involve, um, like I said, it's just keep in mind the marriage, the collaboration. You know, I agree with everything Bianca said, um, but when it comes to the, the, the training, you know, th that's a perfect example. I understand exactly what she's talking about um, when it comes to the trainings and books and, you know, things of that nature, if that's the only thing that's being done. But just everything, like, there just has to be a marriage, you know, there has to be strategic partnerships, you know, like, like I talked about before, everyone doesn't have to agree with what everybody says or um, um, the way everybody goes about something, you know, you don't have to agree with every step, you know, but if there's just, just like I said, between, between the grassroots, the community engagement, the data, the metrics, the policy, there has to be a marriage. So when you look at the trainings and books and things like that, you know, that definitely has its place. But like Bianca said, and this is something that, you know, um, the people that I work with, this is something that I preach. Okay, this is the training. This is some readings I want you to do, but I also want you to put yourself in the space. You know, like it's kind of hard right now with, you know, COVID-19 and pandemic, but you know, when you look at, you know, whether it's criminal justice reform or you look at like um, education reform, you know, go sit in that space and see what people that this is their everyday lives. So you're reading about it, you get it in a training, but go sit in that space and actually see what these people, you know, what people go through that are disenfranchised. You know, and that's what I mean about collaboration and just the marriage of, you know, different things. So that's my call to action is to work with somebody, you know, your whatever, um, whatever your job is or however you're working towards the solution for this problem, work with somebody else that has, that's working from the opposite end. Thank you, Sean. Aaron, did you, did you have any call to action for the community? I don't have one for the community. I have one for myself. I don't know if you're allowed to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, sure. I think it's mostly just to continue having these, not just to continue having conversations, but also, as Bianca said, you know, just to make sure that it's not all talk, that it's actually action. And so um, I think going forward, my work is going to be making sure that I'm reaching out to people like Khalif and Sean and others who have seen the system up front and personal and know exactly what it's like to have to reenter the community. Um, after a period of incarceration, because you're really in the best position to tell us where things need to go and what is missing in the community. So if I can make a call to action to myself, I think it's really just making sure that going forward that I'm reaching out to more people that have that firsthand experience and making sure that they're included in the safety and justice challenge, as well as um, the broader community justice council and really thinking of how we can use the resources and power access and resources that are afforded to us in our positions to be able to help people on the front lines. As, as Tom talked, talked about what his call to action could be or would be, I asked all the panelists to put your contact information in the chat box so our, so our guests can access you if they need to reach out to you. Because Sean, we have somebody who wants to contact you, so would you please put your contact information in the box. Uh, Tom? Yeah, um, I would just say what I said at the beginning, one of the most important things is to lower the you know, the barriers to um, the criminal justice system. And what I mean by that very specifically is we exist as public defenders and as an agency to help people navigate the criminal justice system. And there are a lot of people here who might be trying to help somebody who's having trouble finding a lawyer or finding out how to get in touch with a lawyer who has been assigned. We appoint lawyers in all these revocation cases around dealing with the Department of Corrections. We are accessible and open. You can contact me personally. I'm about to put my contact information or reach out to our office with you know, specific questions you have, and we will do everything that we can 
to you know make connections or help solve problems because the, we should be trying to solve problems in the system and i think that uh, for too often for too long that's not always been how it how it feels but i'm opening that door as wide as i possibly can this evening and it's available to anybody that, that you want to give my contact information or off agency's contact information too, because we have to help each other if we're going to make progress. Thank you. Thank you. Kent? Well, I thought Sean said it really well. At the end of the day, it's going to take um, a lot of us in the community to make this a better place and a more equal place and a place for, you know, that really um, lives up to the ideals that we've always said um, in our community, but in our nation that we've always said we're about and it, that we've really not lived up to. I mean, it's going to take all of us at the end of the day with our, you know, uh, unique perspectives and lived experiences and connections and talents and all of that together to do this. And, um, you know, what I've always believed about Milwaukee with all of its um, imperfections, and we have a lot of them, um, we're also a small enough community that we can, we have the ability to do things, um, you know, as in a city or in a county here if we want to, because we are small enough to get to know one another and to uh, give a call or give an email or reach out. And, and um, I, I do think, I mean, you know, I think we have opportunity here that a lot of other communities don't have in the sense that there are a lot of resources here. There are a lot of foundations that are very generous in this community. And, and I think, you um, there's opportunity here. We have to, though, work together, you know, with a common purpose of making this, you know, a much more equitable um, community for everyone. And um, it can be done if we, if we have the collective will to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The whole thing is about collective will. Well, before we close, uh, we just put in the chat box, there's a, there's a link to the post-session survey because we have gift cards to give away to everybody, $25 gift cards for your for your service and for you participating in this process. Just a modest something, uh, a gift of appreciation from us. If you would click on that link and fill out the survey, uh, we will make sure that you get your gift card. And I would like to thank the Vera Institute. I'd like to thank all our partners in Milwaukee, Mandy and her team and the prosecutor's office and the defender's office for contributing to this rich, robust conversation. Hopefully we have some takeaways that everybody can benefit from. For you people that's in the community and run the organization, you heard the organization, I mean, the SJC and the prosecutor and defense office that reach out to them about how to engage, how to get involved, how to maybe apply for some of the money that they have available. And that's the whole purpose of this process to help elevate your work and that you do in your community to make you more effective and make your communities more safe and sound. Uh, do we have any questions or comments before we close? Any last comments from any of the panelists? We're going to leave the chat. We're going to leave the chat box open for about 20 minutes. So you guys, I mean, there's no rush in filling out the survey, but we're going to leave it open long enough for you guys to fill it out. And there being none, we're right at the top of the hour. I bid you adieu. Thank you for all your support and participation. Thanks, Mandy. Thank you, Ronald, and everyone who attended tonight. That's right. Um, Kent, I see you, John. Hey, John, how you doing? Thanks for joining. Kent, Tom, Khalif, Sean, thanks, everybody.